Hosea chapter 4, small Old Testament book, Hosea, one of the minor prophets. I'll give you just a moment to turn there. We're going to be reading 10 verses today. Kind of an interesting thing, I know some of you here today have lost a spouse or lost a father or mother, brother, sister, dear friend. Yesterday was a first for me, um, as I mentioned earlier about my dad, not having him. There's so many things that go through your mind, right? And um, I think part of one of the things that, uh, you know, you look back on how you're raised and some of the things that you do when you're, uh, that you just kind of get accustomed to because it's just you know, our, our family didn't tend to show a lot of emotion. Um, my mom was a single mom raising two kids, and she was just boom, 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 got to do it, got to do it, and she did it. And so it seems at times there wasn't a whole lot of room for, for emotion. Um, and I, I think I kind of picked some of that up. So yesterday I just want to tell you that I was thinking a lot about my father, and um, it made me think of all of you who have lost spouses or, or uh, parents or Andrew's uh, father is on his deathbed. And, uh, God's grace is really sufficient, all that to say. As I was thinking about my dad and all that he meant to me, um, not getting to talk about the Cowboys as much. Of course, being here in North Texas, I got Jared a lot who visit with me about some things like that and uh, some other sports stuff with some of you others. But anyway, all that to say, praying and thinking of all of you, especially Celebrating birthdays, just really those things that really highlight uh, what's important in life. So, just wanted to say that. I love all of you. Hosea 4, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Hosea chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Let no man strive, nor reprove another. For thy people are as they that strive with the priest. Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. And thou shalt be no priest to me. Saying, Thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. As they were increased... So they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on their iniquity. And there shall be like people, like priests. And I will punish them for their ways, and reward them their doings. For they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom, and shall not increase, because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. And that's where we're going to stop reading, Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. I want you to notice first the scripture says, Hear the word of the Lord. Hosea 4, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to me, children of Israel. Listen. This is really an important statement as we get into the text because this is a good reference point for Israel, for the Jews, Israelites, not only there in Hosea and in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, who thought that because they were of the nation of Israel, they were safe with God. And that is a gross error on behalf of God's people. Because I am the nation of Israel, because the promises were given to Israel and to these Jews, the seed, all of those things that the Old Testament speaks of with God's people of Israel. They made a gross error in thinking that because I am of Israel, I 
am safe with God. They're going to be okay. Nothing could ever harm them, even if they chose not to hear his voice or walk according to their own lusts or, dare we say, even commit sin. They thought everything was going to be okay. And I want to remind you of something. In John chapter 8, when Jesus said these words to those Jews, John 8, 31, Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered. Listen to how they responded to Jesus telling them how to be free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How, how sayest thou, you shall be made free? Jesus was directly telling these Jews, Listen, if you continue in my word, if you are diligent about following me and knowing my truth, you will truly be free. You will truly be free from the bondage of sin. You will be free from committing sin. But if you do not continue in me, you will not be free from this. To those Jews who believed on him, right? Those who said, we are of Abraham's seed. What could ever happen to us? Their response, we are Israelites, we are Jews. Who are you to tell us we shall be made free? In Romans 9, I want to give you one more example to make this very important point. In Romans 9, God used the Apostle Paul to echo this exact same truth to those same Israelites. You are not saved by your birthright. In Romans 9, 2, he said, I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Now listen, this was a great sorrow, a continual sorrow, because God's chosen people of whom were given the promises of God, and God wanted to, to love him and to trust him and to be the light unto all the world and to all the Gentiles. They're still not understanding that to be right with God is always about faith and nothing else. But you see, oftentimes in the Scriptures we've read two examples where God's chosen people thought otherwise. They thought because they were of the nation of Israel, they were going to be saved. But yet God went on to say in verse 6 of Romans 9, this simple and very profound truth, and listen to this closely, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. And we're not going to read the rest of that text, but listen, God is simply saying, just because you're of the nation, just because you were born a Jew or an Israelite, this doesn't make you right with me. Because salvation is always by faith, by you hearing the truth and believing the truth. There is nothing besides that that will ever save you. It was so important for God's people to hear it. And just because you're of the nation doesn't mean you are of faith. It doesn't mean you're in a right standing with God. And again, it is a gross misunderstanding of God's people and all people to think and believe that anything other than your personal faith and believing in Jesus Christ will make you a Christian or will allow you to go to heaven or to be in right standing with God. So I say all that to say this. In Hosea chapter 4, God gets very specific about what is making him upset with this nation of Israel. So first he says, hear this, children of Israel, I have a controversy with you. A controversy. We all, do we understand what that is? I have a contention with you. I want to plead with you about something, and I'm going to spell it out for you quite simply. And that's being a simple-minded man. I always love when, when God spells it out for me. And I hope you do too. So he says, hear this. I have a controversy with you, but here is the issue. I have a problem with you. He spells it out quite simply and directly. I have a problem with you because there is no truth. There is no mercy. There is no knowledge of God in the land. Do we know who he's speaking to? Have we not emphasized that enough already? Israel, I have a problem with you because there is no truth or mercy 
or knowledge of God in the land. And let me ask you, God's people, why is that? Verse 2, by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Now, as we read through these texts, I want to bring something really simple to your attention. If all of these things are really transpiring, all the things we just read in verse 2, if God's called nation of Israel are truly, truly doing all these things, swearing, lying, stealing, committing adultery, whatever else, whatever other sins they were committing, is it any wonder why God is so angry and disappointed with the children of Israel? Is that not a simple understanding? If Israel is doing all these things, is it any wonder why God is so angry or why he has a controversy with them? That where sin is abounding amongst this nation or when sin is prevalent and accepted among God's people, he is chastising them? Listen, if you heard anything we read this morning, Hosea 4, verses 1 through 10 and beyond, this, this is not a pleasant text. God is not pleased. But God has said over and over again to the Israelites, the Jews, to the Gentiles, to the lost people of the world, He has said over and over again to love me and to know me and to follow me every, each and every day of your life is not rocket science. It is actually a very simple thing. Simple things God reveals and discloses. It is not complex to trust in Jesus Christ. And he presented this idea in this manner in a couple of places I want to remind you of in Micah 6, 8. Simple, simple truth. Simple application. Trust, believe in Jesus Christ. Micah 6, 8 says, He hath showed thee, O man, He has shown you what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with thy God? What does He require of you but to do these things? It's no different. It's not a different message to the Israelites. It's not a different message for you or for me. But I hear God saying all the while, what is so complicated about this? What all do I require of you but to do these things? What about in Matthew eleven twenty nine and 30? Another scripture you're familiar with, where the Lord said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thinking of my dad, those are the last words I shared with him, and I don't know if he heard them, but that was the simplest truth God gave me in those moments. Dad, my yoke is easy, the Lord says. And my burden is light. I hear God saying, I'm not requiring anything of you to impose difficulty upon you or make your life hard. You want hard, you go your own way. You search another way. Another way other than Christ. But He's saying, I love you and I want what's best for you. You see, yeah, this may not be a pleasant scripture, but if you look deeper at the text, and if you look at what God is, why He's chastising these Israelites so much, because that's His message. I love you. I want what's best for you. Why do you try to go your own way or make life, life difficult by not listening to my counsel? Why do you always think that removing me from the picture or from the center of life will ever result in anything positive or good? That's a good question for our country, for our nation. It only ends in chaos and destruction because God knows what's best. In fact, God went on to say in Hosea 4.4, 4, Because you lack truth, mercy, and knowledge of God and what He truly wants, here's what happens every time in verse 3 it says, Therefore the land shall mourn. And every one that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Every good thing that God has given and provided, it's going to be gone. You're going to mourn and you're going to languish because you choose your own way. In verse 4, let no, yet let no man strive nor reprove one another. another. 
For thy people are as they that strive with the priest. That's an interesting text. What you are doing will affect everyone, and no one will be excluded from mourning and languishing. And the fact that you will be lacking, first God says. And then he says in verse 4, don't even try to reprove or correct each other in their errors. That's what God is saying in verse 4. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Why is God saying that? Don't even try to correct each other. Don't even try to reprove one another and make it better. Why would God say that? If we see sin or misdeeds happening, God said, don't correct it. You know why? He said, because you're all wrong. You've all left my standard of good, so your standard of good is in error. You see, we have all kinds of people in the world who aren't Christian, who don't want to go the way of the Lord, but they look at somebody else and they say, oh, you're wrong, you're sinning, you're in error. See, God's saying, don't even do that. If you're not going to trust me, if you're not going to put me first as the sinner, don't even correct anyone. And that's what he was telling his people. You've all left my standard, so what good is your standard? And that's why he said, you're as people who strive without a priest. You don't have real spiritual leadership in God's truth. Don't reprove each other. Don't correct each other. You're also caught up in sin. There's no one here to correct you. And what is right. So this is a real criticism and condemnation of God to his people. And is really a tragedy and a sad statement. All who lack God's truth, whether of the nation of Israel or not, will not escape this judgment. Verse 5, he said, Therefore thou shalt fall in the day, the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. And all he is saying, all will fail. Day or night, all will fail. There is no way out of this. And I will destroy thy mother. It's significant because it reemphasizes the message of what we're speaking of in the beginning of our message this morning about finding comfort, comfort rather, in being the nation of Israel and not finding comfort in truly being of spiritual Israel, of the seed of Isaac, the Lord says, those who have received and believed. You put all your trust in the motherland. And God says, I will destroy thy mother. You know what he's referencing there? Have you ever heard of that idea of the motherland? You put all your stock into who you are, where you're from, all your stock into the motherland. I'm of the nation of Israel. I'm of Jerusalem. I'm a Jew. And God is simply saying, I'm going to destroy all that. You think that's important? Listen. Not only will you fall in the day, the prophet will fall in the night, but I will destroy your motherland. In other words, all you have put your trust into, it will be gone. Even your own people and your own nation won't escape this judgment if you do not get right with me. So God, I believe, is asking us today, does this get your attention? Is Israel listening? Are God's people listening to what he is saying? Because again, I think this text is saying these are very simple things in the end. To love me and to trust me and to follow me, the Lord Jesus Christ, to do all of these things, to repent of your sin and come back to the one who gave you life, that is a really simple call. Stop turning your back, Israel. And I will forgive you. But do you know what else is simple? Not just the remedy for you and all people to repent of their sin, to come to me in a moment, God says. Yes, he says, do those things. But also Hosea, Hosea 4, 6 is very simple. The result and conclusion of not doing as the Lord is pleading with you to do. Look at Hosea 4, 6. He says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you. Thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will forget thy children. Why are God's people destroyed? He says it simply and clearly. For a lack of knowledge. You don't know me. 
Could they not know it? God says, you've rejected it. You don't know me. And I'm asking you the question, could they know it? Could they know him? Was it too complicated to understand? Was it the equivalent to maybe understanding trigonometry? And I'm not trying to insult anybody who thinks trigonometry is easy. Some of you might. I don't know. But listen, could God's people not understand his knowledge? He said that's why he rejected them. Because there is no knowledge of me in the land. But I think we all know the, the real reason is they chose to reject it. You know what God's simple response is to that rejection? I will also reject you. Listen for just a moment longer. I want to tell you about that word reject. It means to spurn, to disappear, to abhor, to cast away or cast off, to despise, disdain, become loathsome, refuse, reprobate, and lastly, a vile person. Now, there's a reason I read you all of those English definitions that tie into that word in the original Hebrew language. But I want you to hear all of that because God's people and all people need to understand that should God reject you, should God ever cast you away from His presence, and I assure you He does not want to do that. It is the last thing He wants to do, in fact. But we must all understand that it is not because He doesn't love us. He doesn't desire to have us with Him or because His truth was too complicated for us to comprehend. Remember, these are simple things God has given us. But it is simply because we have chosen by our own free will to reject Him. That is the only reason God will reject you. Not because He doesn't love you. Not because He doesn't want you to come to Him and to bring all of your burdens and cast all of your fears and all of those things that the world brings and Satan brings. It's not that God doesn't want you to bring them. It's that when you see Him for who He is, you say, yes, I will give them to you. I won't reject you. But if you do, He will grant you the desire of your heart. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. And then He says, See, thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. See, God has done nothing wrong. He's done nothing amiss. He has not forgotten anything. He has given us everything we need. And as we close today, the simplicity of God's truth, trusting Him with your life, coming to Him with all of your burdens and all of your being, it could never, ever be overemphasized. And this message is really simple. As God is criticizing and condemning, really, all of Israel for rejecting knowledge, this is really a simple thing. He is saying, I love you. Come to me with everything that you have. And I think our world and our nation, our government, our communities, our schools, our families need strong and continual doses of God's truth and His knowledge. Don't you know that's all we need, God's people? As we pray for an election, as we pray for our communities, there's local elections going on, state elections going on. As we pray for all of those things, don't we know that we just need a continual dose of God's truth? That's what we need. God help us today. When the hearts of men are set on iniquity, as the Scripture says, what can God really do? When men set their heart on iniquity, what can God do? Nothing but reject them. You see, yes, that is a consequence of what God has to do. It's not what He desires to do. It's not what He wants to do. But He has to do it. And everyone needs to understand that. Allow God's truth to change you, or else there is nothing He can do but rid of them. So God is pleading with His people, stand up for His truth. You see, it's simple. Simple message. Stand up for what is true. It doesn't matter how many are against you. It doesn't matter how powerful the enemy is even. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, the Scripture says. You all believe that? 
We may be the minority. If you love God, you are the minority. But listen, if you will stand up for God's truth, if you will fight for the simple things God has already given us, knowledge, mercy, love, grace, faith, fight for those things. And God will meet our needs. So let us live these things in our life and let us extend those things. And let's help make the majority part of the minority. How about that? That would be a great thing for God. So God help us to do that today. Amen. Susan, let's sing an invitation.